Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Ask GN. I think we're on episode number 30, but there's no special occasion. We're just doing another Ask GN. Uh, so as always, post your questions in the comments section below. Finally got that right after saying it wrong the last two videos. If you have questions, post them below. We'll try and get them for the next video. Uh, but this is basically a Q&A segment. So starting off, we've got a question from Reza NL who says, Hi GN, your custom GTX 1080 hybrid mod inspired me to do the same. That's awesome. I am pretty pleased with the result. It doesn't go over 45C OC and under load. My question, how important is the cooling for other components on GPU such as VRAM? Does the hybrid fan really help with anything uh, or just for show? So I talk about this a little bit in the Gigabyte Extreme Review and the EVGA hybrid versus the Seahawk, I think. Yeah, that one. So the, those two reviews, we talked about it a bit because the EVGA card and the Gigabyte card both cool VRAM. Gigabyte one also cools the VRM with its, uh, sort of with its liquid and directly through like copper, solder, heat pipe, solder, aluminum. So very indirectly it cools the VRM uh, and then directly cools the VRAM sort of through a copper plate that connects to the cold plate of the, the CLC. As for how important it is, one thing I can tell you is that when we were doing some of the tests previously with the, uh, maybe I think it was the 1060, I was forced to remove the base plate for some tests. And ultimately we ended up filing down the plate as many of you know, but uh, when doing tests without any cooling on the VR, the VRAM at all, and that includes something like an aluminum plate, it was still performing fine even though the, the blower fan was really doing nothing in that scenario because it was just spinning, there was no enclosure to guide the airflow, there was no cold plate or anything to sink the heat. Uh, so it did perform fine, and by fine in air quotes, I mean uh, didn't immediately crash or exhibit a catastrophic failure. Now. Down the line, it's hard to say how much that actually impacts your lifespan for the card or for the memory. GDDR5 and 5X is not that high voltage, especially if you're not overclocking. Uh, so it's it's not under as much of a threat as something like a GPU or a CPU, some kind of serious piece of silicon. Uh, but to answer the question, does the hybrid fan help? The answer is yes, depending on what you're looking at especially. But in particular, uh, if we're looking at, let's say, a card that doesn't have a copper plate or an aluminum plate on the VRM, the blower fan does more than just cool the VRAM. It does cool the VRM, and that's definitely important. Cooling the VRAM, as I said, it's, it's hard for me to really know the answer to that because we don't have a good way to look at the temperature of the VRAM without actually putting a thermocouple on there or something because there's no software that reads it. Uh, so let's let's kind of push that to the side for now and just talk about the VRM, the voltage regulator module. VRMs get pretty hot. They can sustain a high heat, some of them upwards of 125C for the inductors, but uh, they do still need to be cooled. And they're dealing with basically sort of cleaning your voltage delivery to the GPU, ensuring it gets enough uh, voltage, enough amps, make sure it's all clean. And if that gets too hot and it will lose its efficiency. So you have some power efficiency loss. You can draw more power than is necessary to perform a certain task, whatever it may be you're doing, uh, powering a GPU just to perform a performance cycles or whatever. Uh, so that's important, yes. And the hybrid fan does cool that. It's responsible. When I say hybrid fan, what I mean is the VRM fan that's mounted to uh, the normally the base plate or the shroud or whatever on top of the right side of the board. That cools the VRM generally. Uh, so that is important. VRAM, it's hard to say uh, from kind of a stock clock perspective how important that is. Uh, but we've run it without cooling. I wouldn't recommend it because I don't know what the long-term impact is, but you can definitely do it. Overclocking, probably not a great idea to overclock the memory uh, or overvolt it in AMD's case and then not cool it. Next question is from Aaron Cox, who says, Hi, Steve. I'm considering purchasing an LG 29UM68P, which is the best naming. Monitors, by the way, have the absolute best naming scheme on the planet because they are all letters and numbers, and it's, it's human readable. Uh, he says it's a 21 to 9 ultra wide with free sync and a new, wants a new GPU to pair with it. So here's the question. Is it better for me to get an RX 480 and leverage the FreeSync capabilities of a monitor 
or a 1070 and use its greater raw power to output higher FPS and have a card I can potentially use for longer. Uh, and then he says, more generally, what purchasing behavior would you suggest to people when shopping for cards? Is the old put, most, put the most money into your GPU still valid? Uh, so that's, that's a good question and it's well worded. Let's start with the question of, is it still valid to put the most money into your GPU? As always, it depends on what you're doing. If you're just gaming, I would say, I don't, I don't know that I'd necessarily use the words the most money, but uh, in terms of proportioning your, uh, your purchasing, the GPU is probably still worth spending a good chunk of your cash on for, for most gaming builds. Now it depends, because if your options are buy an i3 or an i5, uh, and getting a slightly cheaper C or GPU can let you get the i5, I'd probably do that instead. Uh, but generally, if you're at an i5 or i7 level already, then yeah, it makes good sense to put some money into the GPU. Um, and that's especially true as we roll into new APIs, if they ever actually kind of start hitting mainstream, which they will eventually, uh, but it's, it's still a little while out, so I wouldn't buy based on strictly API future promises right now. But that is, that is a point where CPUs will kind of be, they're still really relevant. We talked about this before, obviously, but you will be able to get away with a slightly lower spec CPU if you've got a good GPU that can handle, juggle all the draw calls and things like that from a low level API. As for the monitor specifically, uh, that is a very hard question because AMD just, doesn't have something that directly competes with 1070, 1080 current generation right now. And uh, that's not gonna happen until Vega. So it really does force you into the position of, well, I, you either have to buy a 1070 plus to get higher performance or a 480 and you get free sync. And I think my suggestion would probably be, depending on what video card you have now, it may be worth waiting until uh, AMD pushes their Vega GPUs just to get that free sync because it, it would kind of suck to lose free sync. It's actually, just like G-Sync is, it's actually a good feature. Uh, the other option, of course, buy a different monitor, but G-Sync is expensive and the competitors in ultra wide space are very expensive, like the Predator, which is a thousand plus dollars. So my answer to you would be, depending on how you feel, either wait and look at Vega, uh, or maybe buy an RX 480 if you're okay with sitting on, using something now and then pulling it out later, put it in a different box or whatever. They're not that expensive relative to what you're looking at purchasing anyway. So if you have a way to, to repurpose it and upgrade in a couple months, then that might be an okay path to take. But otherwise I'd kind of wait. Uh, 1070 is a good card though. But next question, FD6 says, in your experience, which components are more prone to fail from voltage issues I only ask because I had my fan and audio cables melt down on my R5 case and I was astonished out of all my parts and never thought the case would be an issue. Uh, I've seen that before too. I don't remember what case, I think it was on a Zalman case, a, an exceptionally high quality Zalman case. <laughs> that we, may have, we may have reviewed that one. Um, but uh, yeah, that definitely happens. So it's normally with fan controllers and things on a case, it's just an issue of the fan controller being uh, dumb and, and pushing the wrong voltage and having low quality wires or whatever and they're controlling it. Uh, but for the question of what normally fails in my experience, I have had a good amount of motherboards fail from voltage being pushed through the CPU, things like that, especially FX9000 series CPUs. Even with boards that were rated for them, if it's a low end board, we still had burnouts. We've shown one of those on camera. So motherboards I've had a lot of issues with uh, in the past, not too many recently other than the one with the FX9000. And what else? I have also run into issues, not voltage issues causing a power supply to fail, but I've had plenty of power supplies fail and cause other things to fail because of that. Um, normally after a lightning strike or something, power surge, something like that. But yeah, I'd probably pin it on motherboards for the most common issue that I've run into personally. Uh, video cards and CPUs are surprisingly robust. You can really screw up an overvolt in your, in your BIOS on a CPU 
And as long as you haven't forced that voltage and you haven't started really load testing it, it might actually be okay. Wouldn't recommend it, but um, but they're pretty robust generally, despite being one of the more uh, one of the components you need to be more cautious with. Next question, Matthew Osborne. Hey Steve, when looking at your review for the i7-6700K, that was a long time ago. I noticed there are no comparisons to the 6600K. Is there a reason why they weren't compared directly to each other? Will GN be making these comparisons for future generations of CPUs? I was looking for the difference in frame rate lows between the two chips after Digital Foundry mentioned that the lows uh, is where i7 shows the largest value but didn't provide any graphs. I can reinforce that claim to some extent. Uh, we ha I haven't extensively tested it, but we've looked at things like Metro Last Light in particular comes to mind where um, even disabling hyper-threading, there's actually a big difference. Uh, but I don't have charts for it for you right now. Now, as for why we didn't test the 6600K, it's because I didn't have one. I've got one now because since then we were able to buy one. Uh, Intel does not currently provide us CPUs. Their PR team has changed far too much for me to keep up with, so I just buy them now. Um, but we didn't have one. That's the answer to that. As for the future, yeah, I, I am planning on getting an i5, an i7, probably an i3 on the bench for when Zen comes out. We'll revisit all the kind of core CPUs you'll be buying. That will include the either last or current generation, depending on what, what's up with KB Lake. But, uh, but yeah, we'll be looking at them then. I can say, though, that there are, there are some places where an i7 shows value in the low uh, performance, and it's primarily going to be seen if you're trying to hit like a 144, 120 hertz uh, output for your monitor or something like that. But in Metro Last Light, it's almost double without hyper-threading, depending on the, the CPU specifically. So that's kind of interesting. But the next question is from Tamzid, who says, how do you guys actually calculate 1% and 0.1% lows? Uh, by plotting a frame versus time graph and finding manually to use some kind of software. We, we talk about that in our video called What Are 1% Lows? Uh, or What Are 1% and 0.1% Lows? That answers a lot of that at a, at a pretty decent level. Uh, specifically calculating it, it's just a formula that we use. We have a Python script right now that was done in-house, so the script digs through either presentmon or whatever. Right now it's digging through the presentmon data uh, which we have to use for DX12 and Vulkan testing. So it looks through presentmon at the millisecond presents, like the, the on present millisecond, um, uh, like the latency between the frames. And from there it can calculate, based on frame versus milliseconds, what are the slowest 1% of frames, what are the slowest 0.1% of frames, and then it averages those and you have your value. So that bypasses minimums, things like that. Talk about that more in depth in the other video I mentioned. I think this is the last question. Uh, Dice, uh, Deviant Dice says, will you ever compare this generation's hardware to that of two generations ago, e.g. R9 280 or 760? So we do that in the original reviews um, with the, well, we, two generations ago, okay. We did that with AMD because just the volume of cards thing. So I did look at that with AMD with the 280 and the 280X or something, 285, one of those, and the 380X. I don't think I've actually done that for the current generation Polaris cards or Pascal cards. Uh, that is a good question. That is also a good request. It normally becomes a time thing. My current plan is, because of this question, a couple others like it, is to, to visit these uh, two generation old cards specifically in one-off articles sometime in the next couple months and just basically do a how is the 760 today, how is this the 280 today or whatever and see how they perform now versus other cards that we have on the bench currently. That's the current plan. I, I don't think we necessarily have the bandwidth to include them in specific game benchmarks, for example Gears of War 4 or Battlefield 1. Uh, I'll try but it's, it's really a time thing and there's a high demand for current gen stuff and one gen old stuff. Uh, but we will try and do them in one-offs because of that question and, and others. So as always, thank you for watching. Patreon link of the post video to help us out directly. You can subscribe for more content. Uh, leave a comment below for next week's episode. I'll see you all next time.